opportunity that is coming up for the Polar community and um, take you to the Southern Ocean. Um, but while we talking about the Southern Pole, I also want to extend this invitation to the entire Polar community to, to really get involved in an international initiative that is forming right now and, and think about how Switzerland can contribute and how Switzerland can connect to the international community uh, within this program that's shaping. So um, the Southern Ocean is quite a, a unique place in Antarctica. Um, it's really intrinsically connected to the global climate system um, and, and it plays a very critical role in the global climate system overall. Uh, one of the reasons is uh, that most of the deep water that exists globally in the ocean comes back to the surface around Antarctica. Um, and it's actually 80%, so it's quite a large amount of, of uh, water that's being exchanged in this region and, and gets new properties uh, imprinted in this region. Um, it's also quite special because it distributes the water all around the pole, right? And, and connects the different basins in the ocean um, from the Atlantic to the Pacific to the Indian Ocean. Um, and through this process, it interacts with the atmosphere, it interacts with the ice. It releases a lot of CO2 to the atmosphere, a lot of heat um, in the first place. Um, but then actually it also takes up a lot of uh, heat and CO2, especially the anthropogenic one. Uh, when the new water masses are being formed and subducted and um, uh, does a great service to our climate system as we heard from Petra already. Um, it's, it's a major region, a reason for, for slowing down global warming uh, and um, without this service it would look much worse already now uh, on our uh, global climate. Um, also it loses uh, some of this heat that comes towards the continent to the ice shelves and to the sea ice. But um, through this process it also of course contributes to sea level rise and, and it's, it's very important to understand how this will uh, go in the future. It's, uh, in these respects we have very, some of the major uncertainties in our global climate mo models exist in these um, variables um, for, for our future projections and it's really important to understand them. <laughs> Um, and so through this massive seasonal cycle it has of course a, a major imprint on uh, the local climate on, but also on the entire planet through changing its albedo, right? Yes, and then it's also home to one of the most unique ecosystems on the planet, right? And, and, and these ecosystems are also somewhat under threat with the, 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 the system changing very rapidly and Petra has already said this morning how quickly the sea ice is changing. Um, and of course it has uh, the largest uh, body of freshwater stored uh, on the continent and um, that, that also tells us about the history of our planet and um, is, we know the system is tightly connected to the, the climate evolution on Earth. So, so these are very critical points and one, one thing I want to say is that if we really want to to understand how the future of this region looks and, uh, and, and globally how the future of our planet looks, uh, we really have to understand how, how the system is changing, how the carbon cycle is changing in the system, um, how the, the energy cycle is changing, um, how the freshwater cycle is changing. Uh, but these are just a couple of examples of why we think that this uh, region is very important and that there are actually many things in this region that we haven't understood yet. And for this region, a reason the international community has come up with plans to uh, carry out a major uh, program in the Southern Ocean in a couple of years from now that is called Antarctica in Sync. Well, we will try to coordinate international efforts because the problem is too big to be solved by a single project, by a single country, by a single institution. Um, we can only tackle these problems together. Um, so this is why we need a, a circumpolar and coordinated year-round effort in the Southern Ocean and Antarctica uh, to enhance our observational efforts and to enhance the understanding of the system as a whole. Um, before I go on with what the program is about, 
I would quickly want to remind us of where we are coming from, because this region is not only special in terms of the science and its meaning for, for Earth, uh, but it's also politically uh, uh, very special. And as you all know, we have the Antarctic Treaty System that, that coordinates our efforts, uh, our, our political interests globally um, in this region and, and also tries to protect this region and, and um, yeah, provide the access for science and, and discuss among the countries. Uh, we have a COMMAP who um, basically coordinates logistics internationally in this region um, and that is really helpful to, to get such an effort off the ground to have this uh, logistical partnerships already being in place. Uh, we also have SCAR that, that really coordinates the science and many of you are probably in some sort of SCAR uh, uh, working group or other um, uh, entities from SCAR that really coordinates the international scientific research. Uh, and we also have Kamalar that is taking care of protecting this region and protecting the ecosystem in this region. So there, there is a lot of work in place that we internationally uh, work together in this region. However, um, we are still somewhat disconnected as every country, for example, goes always to the same region, has their own standards, um, and does their own measurement programs, run their own projects, their own ships. Um, and that is uh, something that we want to improve on and, and see if we can share the infrastructure and share also our, our ideas of what standard measurements should look like and compile our data to, to really provide a circumpolar picture. And this is not something that has just been developed recently, but it was developed uh, through the scientific community for many years now, this idea. Um, there is the Southern Ocean Action Plan that clearly uh, points out that we need such an initiative such a global coordinated initiative. Um, there is also the SCAR Horizon Scan that also identifies the need for such a program, as well as, of course, um, initiatives like SUS and ICE, um, where also this MISO report recently came out that um, really works, it's a community that works to, towards such goals for a long time already. So, what is really uh, the aim for Antarctica and Sink? What that we envision to happen. We envision, and that is stated in these reports, to have year-round circumpolar observations, um, in particular in the seasonally ice-covered regions of the Southern Ocean where we, we still have major data gaps. Um, we want an observing network for, for this region um, that integrates the ship-based observations with new technologies that we also have heard about today a lot um, with autonomous platforms, with remote sending efforts. Um, it should be multidisciplinary uh, observations, so a lot of the approach in Antarctica and Sink will be multidisciplinary. Um, and obviously we need to integrate modeling efforts from the first uh, moment and understand where are the needs of the modeling community to improve models uh, to have better future projections, right? And this is really the data that we need to collect. And as I said in the beginning, we need unified measurements. Um, this is in terms of the variables, in terms of the protocols, um, and the metadata and data publishing strategies. Um, so, so this is uh, the main goals for the for the program. Uh, it has been going on for a couple of years now. This program has been discussed also at, for example, the Antarctic Treaty meetings. A lot of countries have already uh, signed letters um, to support. I'm sorry, there was some movement in the slides, so there's some. Uh, words missing, um, but it is now an, an official UN Ocean Decade program and um, it also fits in very well with the newly announced uh, UN Decade of the Prize here that will start next year um, and also SCAR is uh, the so-called UN Decade Collaborative Center that will also help with the coordination of, of the program. But now it's also up to the scientific community it's up to the working group, the expert groups, it's up to you to really also take this opportunity and fill it with life and to come up with science uh, plans, with strategies, um, and, and that is really what we are currently advocating for. Um, in terms of timeline, 
um, as you can see down here, um, this is uh, um, really in preparation for the International Polar Year also, as you see here the UN Ocean Decade, um, the, the, the UN Decade of the Cryosphere starts here and also runs through this period, and Antarctica and Zinc is really um, filling this gap just before the IPY and working towards the IPY to build this international community. And hopefully a lot of the um, uh, measurements and protocols that will be carried out during Antarctic Lenin Zinc should be carried on into the IPY. Um, what are the main scientific aims? Um, and that is really something that um, you can also soon find on this, this fact sheet that will be on the website very soon, um, is to really um, assess the uh, circumpolar connections between the ice, the ocean, the atmosphere, the climate, the environment, and the life, of course, in this region. Um, and that also includes the, the human pressure that's being imposed <coughs> on this system right now, and that uh, we also understand this, how the system is, is changing and what uh, human, the human influence is. Um, we really want to accelerate uh, the, and the generation and, of, and the use of knowledge and um, to understand the Antarctic and the Southern Ocean um, in, in terms of the research but also in terms of the policy driven needs, um, the, the societal needs um, and, and really also ensure that the knowledge um, is being provided as openly as possible. Um, to the entire community and this, uh, that would follow fair principles for, for data publication. And obviously it's to have, enhance collaboration in this region overall. Um, in terms of the structure of Antarctica and Zinc, it's, it's a very multi-structural <coughs> approach. There is multiple dimensions to this. Um, obviously we will have uh, multiple nations to be involved. There's multiple disciplines to be involved, so it goes all the way from the land to the atmosphere to the ocean to the sea ice to the ecosystem to the snow layer. Um, that's all involved. And um, in terms of the science, uh, we have started to identify major uh, priorities for the science, what we call themes, um, that are meant to be interdisciplinary, where also the different disciplines can contribute to major outstanding questions in the field. And you can also find these five themes currently on the website. It doesn't mean that these are the five final themes. Um, so if you think like, okay, the, the research you're doing and you want to contribute to Antarctica and think um, does not fit into these themes that are existing, uh, um, we can also build further themes uh, to, to, to be integrated. Um, and, and these themes currently are the Southern Ocean Heat and Freshwater and Carbon Budget, obviously and their response to climate change. It's about improving the knowledge and uh, the protection of the unique Antarctic life that goes all the way from the land to the ocean to the seafloor. Uh, it's about anthropogenic uh, signatures and, and um, pollution in this region and the anthropogenic pressure. It's about the melting ice shelves and their impact on coastal regions. Um, and it's about the rapid sea ice decline that we have been observing in recent years. And what it does to the system, what it does to the ecosystem, what are the consequences, what are the causes of this. Um, just to give you some examples of, of work that is currently being planned for and that is ongoing efforts. So one example is um, the, um, for Scheme 1, the, the carbon budget. Uh, we know that we have major difficulties understanding whether some regions of the Southern Ocean are actually a source of, sink to, of CO2 to the atmosphere. There's differing uh, estimates and um, we also know that a lot of this difference comes uh, in in winter when we have difficulties to to reach this region so one of the targets was obviously be to, to really um, reconcile these measurements and uh, go there in winter and uh, measure the carbon system of the region to really resolve these issues. Um, as I said the other component is this rapid sea ice decline that you can see here so there's been this major drop of sea ice uh, extent in the Southern Ocean in 2015-16 and it hasn't really recovered since then and, and really understanding this is, is a key priority um, for Antarctic and Zinc. Also, for example, what happens under the sea ice is, is something in winter that we don't really understand yet and, and um, many of 
uh, systems, they, they are very hard to, to measure, they are very difficult to access and obviously with a uh, um, bigger shared infrastructure in this region we will be able to, to better understand uh, what happens uh, in the winter under the CS. Um, currently, um, there is a partnership for Antarctic Financing internationally. I mentioned this already when I mentioned the Antarctic Treaty. Um, there is many uh, nations that um, are already involved. You can see here the, the institutes and the contacts that, that are already involved. Um, SPI is also obviously already uh, involved in these discussions and, and this list is growing uh, constantly. So you can see that it's really already a big international effort behind this. Um, here you can see all the institutions that are already um, um, interested in contributing. Um, in terms of what the scientific community can do and what, how you can get involved, um, there is multiple ways. Um, so obviously you can uh, um, collect scientific ideas that you have, uh, scientific interests that you have, um, you can form working groups, you can do this on a national level, but also on, the, on an international level where you might be already involved in these working groups. Um, and uh, you can also um, put forward plans um, to the steering committees, you can reach out to the national contact points that I just listed before. You can also reach out to us uh, to, to see if there is other interest in this, uh, in this um, topic, so to say, that, that you are identified. Um, and you can also bring forward, for example, uh, infrastructure or propose uh, national committees or, or, or uh, try to generate funding uh, in your respective country. Um, you can also sign up and register on the website already. Um, this is currently just personally for, for people staying informed. In, in the future there will be a possibility to also register work, working groups uh, on the website. Um, and just a last word for in terms of the science contact, you can also reach out to either Stephanie or me um, if, if you are interested in, in contributing and you have some ideas um, that you discussed with your colleagues already. Uh, with this, I want to thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have and uh, just also approach me afterwards if you want to discuss this a bit more. Thank you very much. on the inputs we had before and but go maybe also a, a step back we heard satellite data is very nice um, for research long-term observations and so on and so forth but actually my goal and why I'm here today is rather bringing back to you not knowing too much maybe about satellite data but still having it as a tool that you can use for your work for your leisure time or whatever <coughs> actually um, I'm part of the so-called Space Exchange Switzerland now, which has a mission, it wants to amplify the voice of the Swiss space ecosystem. So we are a consortium who tried or who fostered the use of satellite technologies and satellite data in my case, um, that consists of five different entities and myself, located at the University of Zurich, have actually um, the Swiss um, national point of contact for satellite images at the university and my task is actually to foster the access and the use of satellite data in Switzerland within this consortium. And it is a public service, so it is paid through the Swiss government and exists actually already for more, several decades of years with the idea that we foster what we kind of invest also into the European Space Agency and the development that is, that is done through the agency. Uh, the customers actually is very broad, meaning it's a public service for everyone, meaning not only researchers, but even you as a private person, whatever NGOs, uh, companies, startups for instance, and so on and so forth. And what we do at the University of Zurich is mainly science-based consultations. So if you have any questions, you just can come to us and say, okay, I would like to use satellite data for research, for instance. Then we either can help you where to get the data, what type of data exists, 
give some insights in how to use the data or just point you to someone else who has already expertise. But on the other side, we are also doing like outreach activities, workshops, even from um, high school students up to professional or companies. We are a small team, but we are open for any uh, questions. And we are complemented by the part that is located at Swiss Lopo, which is mainly dealing with rather what we call operational tasks, meaning if you want to um, buy uh, high resolution satellite data from a certain region, or even tasks or ask for certain satellite data by yourself for, for your work, for instance. But what we actually mainly do is planting a seed. We do not have a lot of resources to do our, our own research or our own development, but what we want to do is actually enable knowledge. So we want you to enable that you can do your work by your own. So we help with first steps, we help with education, where to get the data, how to use the data correctly, or even um, products. But what we want is to plant a seed that then can grow within Switzerland, that the satellite data can be used uh, more often and in a better way. This is usually the slide I show when I start uh, with my presentations. So it's about what is remote sensing and what is Earth observation. Actually, the most important point here, and I think in particular for the, for the cryosphere community, is without touching. What do I mean with, it, with without touching? I will just give briefly uh, an example that most of you might know. So it's the region where we have this twin glacier collapse in Tibet. And what you can see here is a nice image from Sentinel 2 from January 2016. And so far, um, not much is visible. But actually we know that something's going to happen just afterwards, but actually we can access this remote area without going there. We can just check the images that were available and captured by Sentinel-2 by just continuously. And we can actually go and back and look back into the past because we knew that there was this collapse of the glacier so we were able to go back and see what was the status before and when was the collapse. So we can get quickly an overview on the region of interest, what happened, and we can even do some basic analysis, of course, because we have a scale, we have over two images, so that's just easy, you don't have to go outside. You just need to access the data. We also can get continuous image continuously observing the Earth, and what you can see here is actually a few um, weeks later, it was snowing, and we knew that there was a, a second event that happened, but you don't see much because everything is white. So we do some miracles, as you heard before, we have multi-spectral uh, images, but we can, that means we can play a bit around with the, with the bands uh, available. And suddenly you get a new perspective and you see, okay, there is cloud. And exactly our region of interest is covered by clouds. Oops, that's so nice. So then we can go further and you saw there is a huge satellite fleet available. And you can change the sensor and <coughs> more miracles, you can look through the clouds. And you see also the second uh, twin glacier, um, how it came down and what was the extent of the island. In summary, I'll show you uh, actually my favorite glacier where uh, I spent a lot of field work. Um, and I, I will show you a time lapse starting from the 80s, so like historical satellite data. And why I like this time lapse is not just because it's a beautiful glacier, but also it shows the evolution of the technology the last years, next to the glacier retreat, of course. So if we start the movie, we have, one, we have an image per year and you see that in the 2000s the glacier starts to retreat but you also can see that the image now starts to be more clear and higher resolution. So this is kind of the historical data that we had before, still available from the Landsat time towards the Sentinel-2 with the improvement in sensors, repetition time and so on and so forth that can give us a lot of information. And now, if you would like to test and to see by your own satellite data, I can tell you, it's quite easy nowadays. 
you just go to this website, which is um, uh, the data space from Copernicus. You can, up to the right, you can enter whatever you want. I entered the location of today. And I checked when was the last image captured that overflew Fribourg. And if you can see in a second, it was two days ago. So we had another hour flight on the 10th of September, quite cloud covered. So we can check what happened or when we had the last image rather cloud free. So you can see all the hour flights and on the 16th of August we had the last more or less cloud free image. And here we can directly play around with all the different bands we have available. We can make different features visible like the clouds or the vegetation. And for the one who already know a bit more of the satellite data, this is actually the new portal that the ESA has where you can also directly download the original data, meaning the, the individual tiles um, from Sentinel. Like this, so that, that's how it looked before. And here you get the original data that you can then process by yourself as well. Yes, with that, um, I would just say if you have any questions, just uh, drop an email or call me or whatever and we can try to help you and if you're interested and then thanks for your attention.